um, we'll be uh, posting this up to the YouTube channel so you all can see this uh, later, especially those of you all driving for this Thanksgiving holiday and want to actually check out the slideshow presentation. Um, we will also make sure that uh, we can post the uh, PowerPoint presentation on our website after this. So I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Um, today we have John May and John is going to be talking about the enterprise databases and tips and tricks for a distributed system. Uh, John's been in the GIS uh, uh, world for a long time. Uh, I guess he got started back in 1998. The U.S. Forestry Service has done a lot of consulting all over the United States and other places for, for a long, long time. It's based out of Fort Worth and we're very excited to have John today. So John, I'm gonna turn it over to you. And again, we appreciate you for being here today. Thank you. Okay, thanks. One quick correction. I started in 1989. So oh, I apologize. I thought I had it here. Did I wanted to just mess that up? But well, no worries. Very good. No worries. Uh, it's just the, the software landscape was a little different between 89 and 98. So I'm from the old world of Esri. Uh, and have been using it since then, right? 30 some odd years. So uh, yeah, what I wanted to do today, this is a, probably a talk I wish I had seen somebody else give years ago when you know they got to the enterprise landscape. And that is, you know, somebody who kind of figured out enterprise databases and had a lot of handy shortcuts and tips to make life easier. And so the thought hit me this year as I said, man, I ought to try to make a little talk out of that and that might help somebody out. So that's what this is all about. A uh, couple uh, business items. I've never done one of these Zoom presentations before, so I may fumble or stumble. I'm used to standing in front of a crowd of people and looking people in the face. So now I'm just looking at a PowerPoint. So it's, it's awkward for me, so I wanna push through it. Um, the other thing is I'm getting over a cold. So I may pause to st stop and cough or uh, I'll cover my mouth, but um, or drink some water only because I'm at the tail end of it and I just, you know, I just gotta deal with it. So with that said, I'm just gonna launch right into this, okay? So in, in my view, there are three really important things that you need to really think about. And I mean, think about when you start entertaining the idea of building out an enterprise database. Um, now you may be using an enterprise database uh, because it's available in your organization, but really all you're doing is just dropping feature classes in there and you know connecting to it and doing your normal day-to-day -day GIS stuff. But when I talk about enterprise G databases, really what I'm thinking about is a true RDBM, RDMS, whatever, um, you know, a big relational system that's designed to support a large scale business activity. Um, so that means the first thing you got to really think about is the database design. Now, there are entire college curricula built around the idea of, you know, the concepts of database design. So you could speak for days on just that. But the database design is an important thing to consider because whatever you design in the database will influence how you do your work in the GIS environment, okay? And um, there are things you can do that will make your work harder to accomplish, and there are things you can do that will make your work easier to accomplish. So database design. Uh, the next thing is um, things that you need to be aware of when you plan on publishing content from your enterprise database for use in a collector or survey one, two, three, or the new one, field maps applications, right? Um, there's a lot of little important considerations uh, that if you evaluate them carefully, they'll save you a lot of time on the back end when you publish those things. And then finally, Workflows and data automation. <clears throat> so my workflow about is accomplishing a set of tasks in some linear fashion. And data automation refers to limiting the amount of interaction you require of your users 
to extract data from the system. So you can do some of that by automating the data, uh, basically making an intelligent design in your database. Now, the important note uh, that I'm talking about here is that this presentation is focusing on either SQL Server or Oracle databases. Uh, that's where my, all of my experience lies. You, most of what I show you can be accomplished with a post GRE SQL database. I just don't spend a lot of time working in them because I just don't, right? So, uh, but you, you know, a lot of this is available to be done in there as well. Um, but really SQL Server or Oracle is, um, you know, where I spend all my time. So it's where most of my experience is. Um, so moving on to that. The first thing to think about in database design when you're dealing with the GIS world in the ESRI environment is your field order. Um, that might sound silly, but it's really not. Uh, here's why. Um, when you are using a published service, you're going to retrieve information from that service by clicking on a feature and that's going to cause a pop-up window to appear, right? So that pop-up window is going to display whatever attribute information that you want to have available in an order. Now, the order by default is the order by which the fields were added to the database when you built it. So let's just make a silly example here. Let's say you have... Um, uh, a database of widgets, you know, features out there in the landscape, we'll say they're points. And um, one of them is some unique ID that you want your users uh, to identify the point with, let's just say. So they're going to call it ABC or one, two, three. Uh, and then you're going to have another uh, attribute that says, what type of point is this? You know, is it an A point, a B point, or a C point? Well, when you design your database, if you were to add the uh, field for uh, what type of point first, and then next add the field for what's my point ID, that's the default uh, way in which they'll display in a pop-up. Now, all of you are pros, I know. So you're sitting there going, oh, where's this guy coming from? He doesn't know much. I could just go into my configure pop-up window tool uh, and the web interface and reorder those things? And the answer is, yes, you can. But I want you to consider this. In a, a real enterprise system, your attributes, you might have 50, 70, 100 different attributes for a feature class. You don't want to be in the business of trying to rearrange that 100 items into an order that you want to appear in a pop-up window. That'll drive you crazy. Plus that window is unstable when loading large collections, list collections. So what'll happen is you'll be able to do some, then you'll have to cancel, then you'll have to open it back up and do some more until you finally get to the, the final set, final order that you want them in. So what I would suggest is that when identifying the fields that you want to be present in your database, uh, when talking with your end users, you also ask them how they'll want to view that data. Make a spreadsheet on that spreadsheet, you know, have a column for fields, uh, you know, so you have your list of fields and then ask them to order them, put them in the order they want them to appear in a pop-up window. And then use that as a template to start building your database from, right? Now, the next thing is when you are dealing with an enterprise database, there's two ways you can, you know, do the initial table or database design, <clears throat> you can go straight into the enterprise database and do it. What I recommend instead is create a file or a personal geo database um, and do all of your preparatory work in that. It's so much easier to shell in and out of those files than it is to go in and out of your um, enterprise database. So use a file or personal geo database to nail down the design of your feature class tables or your, you know, your related tables, you know, your, your inspection tables or your maintenance records tables or anything like that, right? Build all that out in, in an environment outside of your enterprise database. 
so that you can test them, you can tweak them, you can finalize them. And when you get to a final state, then you can migrate that to the enterprise database. Next thing, and this is my just one of my old database hat wearing pet peeves is field names. Uh, I'm sure everybody on this call has seen uh, a file sent to them <coughs> that um, contains GIS data. And they open it up and they look at the attributes, and the column names are nonsensical, or you know they're they're, they're just weird collection of numbers and letters, right? Don't do that. You're gonna make your life miserable. You're gonna make somebody else's life miserable. Go ahead and use long name conventions and use camel casing. And by that, if you look over here where I think I have this, uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but uh, on the right-hand side of the screen, it says uh, the fourth and fifth one down, cartograph database ID. That's a field in the database, right? So what have I done there? I can look at that field and I know, oh, that field is supposed to contain the ID that came from a cartograph database. I don't have to scratch my head and kind of wonder what they're talking about there. The camel casing means use an uppercase letter for the beginning of each new word and that, right? Now, there's another reason you wanna do this. And that is when you start writing SQL queries, it'll be so much easier for you to remember field names if you've gone through and followed this rule for field naming, right? You won't have to have a cheat sheet to look up and say, oh yeah, we called the field to store what type of thing it is, we called it X, right? Just, you know, you won't have to do that because you'll know because you followed the system that that field is gonna be named this and then you'll be able to write SQL a lot faster. Um, then there's always the situation that occurs is, what happens if after you've done this design, right, you need to change the order of a field as it appears in the database? Happens a lot, right? Now you can't do that in a file geo database. That's not possible. Um, you can do it in an enterprise, so it's Oracle or SQL database by using um, SQL. You can change the order, but this is not an operation I would recommend because Esri stores um, as part of the SDE engine, descriptions and properties about each table. And in those descriptions and properties, they're in the HTML fields or XML fields. Uh, they will list out the names of the fields and the types and all this other stuff. And they will be in a particular order and that would be the order they were created. So even though you could use uh, SQL Server, you know, just standard SQL, change the order uh, of a field and a table, it will not change the order of the information contained in the SDE you know, business table. So there is a way to do this. And this is why I say always do your initial database design outside of the enterprise database. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to escape out and show you what this screen was intended to do in a static talk. So if you have uh, built your feature class table in a personal geo database, that's an access, an MS access database, right? You can do this. This is the table definition in MS access for a feature class. Those are all the attributes for that feature class. If you've decided that that attribute needs to be elsewhere on this list, say right there, you can just drag it up and then you can save that, right? And now it's moved and problem has been solved. You don't have to do anything more than that. So the only thing that's a trick there is you have to have a copy of MS Access to do that. Um, you can make the personal geo database without owning a copy of MS Access, but to open it and modify it, you have to have a copy of MS Access. But that's a life-changing situation right there, being able to reorder those fields rather than having to go back to scratch and create another table and then start adding the fields again in a new order, right? 
your list of fields stay the same, but the order is changed. You can change them in access just by dragging them around. That's why doing all your work outside the enterprise database will ultimately save you a lot of time because you want to nail it down, get it all agreed upon and signed off on, and then you migrate that to the enterprise database. And there's different ways you can do it. You can do an XML X workspace export, or you could just uh, copy it from your personal geo database, you know, into the enterprise database. The next thing I want you to talk, want you to think about field aliases. Now, you'll notice here I have a one that's highlighted. It says facility name. It's selected, right? We're in the feature class properties window. Now, if you look down below, it says field properties, and it says what's the alias here? Outfall name, right? This is important. Don't skip this step ever, ever, ever. If you don't put an alias there, what's going to happen is it's going to show the database name for that column everywhere you do any kind of query, right? Uh, every time you publish a service, that's what it's going to use. And then when your users come back and say, I want that to say X, then you're going to have to go into another configuration window. And you're going to have to change it or modify it. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, I'm only going to have to do that one time. But what happens when you have to republish that same feature class to be a member of five or six other services? Now you're going to have to remember to go change that in all those other services as well. And this is a cascading problem. So the way you get around that is you go ahead and assign your field alias at the beginning of the game. Here again, this is something you do before you copy it into the enterprise database. And that means for every individual column that you have, you want to set the alias. So I'm going to shell back out here. I'll go here. Let's see. Oops, I, I, meant, I meant to have this ready, but I can do this pretty quick. Let's see. Um, so now we're in ArcMap, right? And we're at the fields, right? So you notice the field name is statewide facility ID, but you notice the alias is statewide outfall ID, facility ID, hard of base, whatever, right? FM number, work program number. So you do this. Now you see this, this is actually real working data. There are a lot of columns here. If you were to not assign aliases as part of designing your database, then what's going to happen is when you publish your service, you're going to have to go in there and you're going to have to manually assign an alias for every field that you have published. And it doesn't get remembered except for that one published service. So when you publish the same feature class for another service, you're going to go through that operation again. So here again, if you want to save a lot of time, um, you go ahead and you give each field an alias to begin with. And then you don't have to worry about it anymore, right? So let's see. Next one, database domains. So domains are handy. Uh, a lot of people like to use them, but there are some important things to consider when you're wanting to use a domain. So for instance, in my example here, I have a field that says is transferred and it's meant to be a yes, no field, right? And so I have uh, set, a do I've created a domain called the yes, no domain down here. You see that domain name and it has two values. One is yes and one is no. And then um, what happens when you publish your service is if you're entering data and you go to that column on the form as you're making an edit and you'll see a drop down when you click on it and you have a choice of yes or no. Now you'll notice here, I have it set to allow null values. That means a user can ignore that field and save any changes to the record. Alternatively, you can say don't allow null values. That would force them to enter it. 
you can do it that way too. I, I'm kind of agnostic on that, but I lean in the direction of not forcing them if we know that the default is going to be something. So in this case, we have a default value. That is, if the people ignore that field, we automatically set the value to no. In other words, they don't have to think about it. They don't even have to click the drop down and enter it. The default value is no. They can just skim right over it, go on to the next field. Now, this, this is important to consider. When you're looking at a large database, what you want to do is minimize the number of empty fields that are present in the uh, table when you're looking at it. And the reason you want to do that is it eliminates the possibility of having a conversation of, are we missing data, right? So if every field's accounted for, that's a big plus. Now, domains can help you do that. Default values can help you do that. And there's some other tricks that help you do it down the road. I'll show you with SQL. Um, so for setting a domain, it's a database property. Um, and one other thing I wanted to point out here is avoid using codes. So here, I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, the domain is part of the database rather than the feature class. And so here's a list of domains. So you'll see here, I have the yes, no domain, right? Now it's text and you notice I have here a code and I have a, a column called description. Now in the old mainframe world, you would to save space and memory, you would use integers to represent a long text description, right? So you could say the code is one, one for yes and zero for no, right? So it uses very little database real estate to store those values. Um, this is my feeling about that. That was the old days. Database real estate is not nearly as expensive as it used to be. Uh, and we're not dealing with billions and billions of records in these things anymore. So I just go ahead and say, set the code to be equal to the same thing as the description, right? And there's another reason you're gonna wanna do that when you get down the road. And that is if you're actually writing SQL queries to extract data from the database, because this is what will happen. You'll see here, I am now, I've got this feature class loaded. And you see here, I'm in edit mode. So I can say, oh yeah, it's left and right, all right? It's left, right, and center, right? And that's what the domain is actually showing me. Well, what's happening here <clears throat> Let's go back to the domain for side of road. Looky here. See, this is where I, this is how I learned this, right? I broke my own rule. I set the code to be C and it stands for center. So what the user sees is the word center, but what gets stored in the database is that letter C. So I'll show that to you right here. Let's see. I got it somewhere. All right. So here is, you see here the facility ID, and it shows you what side I wrote on. This is an actual query from the feature class. It says it's on R, LR, whatever the case may be, right? But that's not handy if you're going to write a report, right? Because you want the report to say it's on the right side of the road or the left and right, so on and so forth. So the way you get to that is you have to write this particular bucket of SQL right here to go ahead and extract the coded values and translate them into their descriptions. So that particular bucket of SQL right there gives you the result you would want, which is that's right, that's left and right, so on and so forth, right? That's the center. Now, I hate having to write that. So the way to get around that when using domains is to just go ahead and put the word center here, put the word left for code, so on and so forth. Now I don't have to write a bunch of SQL to decode this because what could happen is if you have a feature class that has domains, and, then, and I have a lot of feature classes, and there's a lot of domains in each feature class, and then there are related tables, and each of those tables, because they're inspection forms, have 
links to 15 or 20 domains, right? If you, you <laughs> and this, all those things, all these things would compound so that your SQL statement would get really hairy after a little bit of time and you would have to, uh, you know, just re-engineer re all that. You, you're just gonna end up not liking it. So that's why I say the best route is to go ahead and make your code the same value as your description for all text domains. It's gonna save you a lot of time. Nope. Oh yeah. So there's that. I've been showing you. I've been shelling out and showing you what these screens do. All right, relationships. The next thing, this is really important. If you're uh, building a database, even if you don't immediately have tables that are related to your feature class, always give your feature classes global IDs. So if you don't know how to do that, that's pretty simple. You just go to the feature class and sit, right click on it, say manage and say uh, add global IDs, right? And what that's gonna do is it's gonna add a column and that column is gonna be, it's gonna store what's called a globally unique ID and it's unique within that database. That's the important thing to remember. So that unique ID is unique within d5dev.gdb. Same rule applies for any database in the cloud, you know, any named database environment. Um, let me get back here. Uh, it'll be unique within the context of that database. That's an important consideration. But always, you want global IDs um, set up as part of your feature class. And especially if you're going to build relationships because relationships require a primary and a foreign key, right? And you want to make sure your global IDs are used to establish that relationship because if you use a default object ID, they're not guaranteed to be um, persistent. So hold on a second. <coughs> An object ID for a feature that is number 100 today for a host of reasons could be number 109 in, in a month or two. And if you have a relationship established on that, you risk corrupting your data. So you always wanna use a global ID. Now, if a relationship spans two or more tables, right? gonna have to make sure, oh, let me back up. In order to establish that, you'll notice here, you got what I have here and I'll shell back out. This is actually handier. <coughs> Excuse me. If I go to the um, inspection table here, we'll come here. But the inspection record has the global ID field, but it has another GUID field, right? I've added a field, it's the type of data is GUID, and I gave it a name, and that says parent GUID. And that refers to the record in the parent table that it's related to. And that's what you would use to establish the relationship, right? Because you wanna say this feature class maintains a relationship with this table and the relationship, I guess since we're here, we can just do it real fast, right? We can say, this is related to that. And we'll say it's composite, many to one. We don't need that right now. And then we'll go, what's related to what? And we're gonna say, the global ID is related to the parent GUID. What that does, the database engine behind the scenes manages that for you. And then <coughs> when you add an inspection record to this, it automatically encodes that inspection record with the global ID of that record. <coughs> and so everything's good. The only thing to be aware of is if that second table, that inspection table has another table related to it. You cannot reuse the parent GUID name in that other table. 
So what I do is I call, I call the name inspection GUID to refer to the global ID of the inspection table that the other table is related to. Because it's not that um, you, you can't do it from a practical sense, you can give it any name you want. But what will happen is when you publish the data <clears throat> and try to add data, it will um, mess up the relationship and not honor them. <coughs> and you'll get lost data. So make sure you be aware of that. Now, field display, the public service always obeys the alias rules. So you see here, I've got an example of a screenshot where I published something and I didn't give it good aliases. Look at those, right? There's no spacing in there. So that would mean that I would have to go to the configure attributes thing and individually edit, oops, sorry, I'm, I'm used to looking at that and wanting to click on it, individually edit each column, each row in that column there to get them to look the way I want them to look. On the other hand, if you are taking the time when you design your database to give those meaningful aliases out, they would already be loaded there. So you wouldn't have to do that. Big time saver. All right, the next item, <coughs> feature class aliases. So you see here, we've got, that's the, you know, the leading part of course is the database name, the owner name, and then you have the feature class name. That's what the dot separations represent, right? Well, your database properties also have an alias property. So I recommend doing the same thing for those, right? Use your um, <coughs> properties window for your feature class and assign your feature class an alias because that means when you publish it, when you add it, first of all, to your Arc Map or you know, Arc Pro, it'll automatically load in the legend with the name that you assign as an alias. That's the first thing. That's a time saver. The second thing, when you publish it, it's going to publish the alias name and not the long, full, fully qualified database name instead. So the same rules apply for fields as they apply to feature class aliases as well. There's a picture of how to do it. Okay, moving on. Oh, very important to remember. I mentioned earlier, you know, I have these feature classes. They might have 70 or 100 columns, but they have a service that they want published and a quickie do map that they're going to use for some business process. And they only want to see five or six fields. And so you're thinking to yourself, well, I'll just turn those guys off in arc map before I publish it. And then I'll just have them there when I go ahead and publish my web map and then everything is copacetic, right? That sounds good until this happens. They come back a week later and they say, you know, we changed our mind. We wanna add five more fields. So now you gotta add five more fields. What happens when you publish that service the first go around is it's gonna publish the first five fields you selected. Now you go back into your, your MXD file and um, you turn on some additional fields and then you republish it by overriding the previous one because you've done some other stuff, you don't wanna to have to go through doing it again. So you republish overriding the previous one. What that'll cause to happen is it will take the new fields you selected and append them to the bottom of the list of the first five fields you published. So now everything's out of order. So what happens is you gotta play in the window, dragging them up and down to get them in the right order. So the best way to get around all that is to go ahead and publish all your fields, right? Publish them all and then turn them off in your configuration, pop-up configuration tool. I should also point out that if they're not all published, those fields won't be available for using for any web queries. So our, our filters that you wanna build on a back end, especially with a web application, uh, even if they don't want to, you don't want them to display in a pop-up window, they still need to be available on the published list. Otherwise, you can't build any filters around them. So remember, fields are always published in the database order. They always obey the aliases you set up. And if you publish all your fields, then all you have to do is turn off the ones you don't want to see, and you won't have to republish a service. 
to get fields back at it. Now let's go, uh, workflow and data automation. <clears throat> if you don't know SQL, let me recommend Code Academy. They have a lot of free resources. It's not really that hard. I mean, it can be hard if you really wanna become like PhD level SQL guy, but you don't have to be that to get a lot of meaningful work done. You can just go ahead and start off with learning how to do simple queries and slowly build on top of that. Now, if you're using um, this software, this is uh, Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio, right? Um, this is what I use to write all the SQL in and I can query the database. I mean, you know, I can see the contents of the database and everything else, but I could, you know, go ahead and poke around in the database and look at stuff. If you're using, and I don't use it anymore because I don't have any Oracle work going on, but if you're using Oracle products, the database, you can use a PL SQL developer. Um, look at there, that's a typo, and I can fix it live. Um, PL SQL developer. You can also use Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio to connect to an Oracle database. So it's really up to you. I'm not, I've never used SQL developer SQL developer to collect a SQL server database. So I can't say if, if it does it as well, but those are, they're both free pieces of software um, and they're very powerful and you can do a lot of stuff with them from the database management side. So get familiar with them. Now, six tricks that you can do with SQL. Here's an, a good, good example. In this particular instance, this top one here, there was a decision made by the um, managers of this project that they want to have a statewide, un globally unique, meaningful facility ID assigned to every record collected by every district of the Department of Transportation uh, throughout the state. So that when all the data <clears throat> was brought back together into one bucket, the person could look at the statewide ID and know some things about it. So the things they wanted to know was what district did it come from? So D3 stood for the district. What type of feature was it? So OF was, you know, represents the type of feature, stands for outfalls. What county is it located in? So this here, county code, and then some unique number, right? And so we set up a sequence table, right? Uh, the increments by one, it'll hold up to five places of digits and we just get the next value for the sequence, right? So what does that look like? That looks like this. Let's, uh, Oh my, look at that. You always get a typo when you're rushing, right? And then you do it twice just to show everybody you're human. All right. So this obviously is a rules-based naming convention, but we don't want to ask the users to be in charge of creating that. So what we do is we create a trigger and that trigger gets fired every time they create a new record in the feature class. It's a database trigger. And what it does is it says, update any record in that feature class that is where the statewide facility ID is empty. That's null, right? Update it to be equal to this string right here, right? And that's what creates this, and this is handy. Now this is done, this, this is all being done for uh, the state of Florida. They got eight districts, so it's eight separate organizations that are all collecting data, all in the one big database, but all of their data is individually separated from the other districts. So they all have their own basic database tables for this, their data. 
So users don't think about this. The system creates that for them. That guarantees that you're not gonna ever have a problem with it. The other thing you can think about is some people have expressed an interest of wanting, uh, well, not some, this is global, uh, wanting to be able to run or execute a report from SQL Server reporting services for a given record in the database. So of course, you know, you use something like SQL Server reporting services to author your reports. This is another free piece of software. It's the Visual Studio Shell. You can get it and then connect to the database and author reports. And then what you have is, let's go ahead and say, um, So along with the trigger that creates that unique ID, the trigger also says for the field report facility, I want you to go ahead and create the hyperlink that links to this SQL Server report server. And then that report, it actually is designed to accept that features global ID as a parameter to go get data for it. So I didn't set this up. Let's see. Let's see if we can pull this off. I'm guessing not. <laughs> now that we're, um, yeah, I'm not gonna be able to render that report, but the report I could render it from here. Let's try this. Which one was that? E3. This is the same report. It would just render from the pop-up window. There you go, right? It's an actual query against the database, puts it on a Bing map, loads some sub reports, tells you if there's anything that's ever been out there before, you can click on that and it'll go load the sub report or previously loaded inspection, right? With some photos. So all of that's tied together based on the global ID and based on a trigger that's automatically calculating this. So that the users, when they're either in uh, a web viewer or in collector, can actually click on a link and get to the report. So it's pretty easy. Users don't have to think about it. The next thing, a lot of people, haven't you ever got the request, right? Uh, hey, could you tell us the latitude and longitude coordinate for all these points, right? So, you know, what do you do? You, you go at it. You add a longitude and add a latitude field and calculate them, so on and so forth. You output it to a spreadsheet, whatever the case may be, right? Well, you, the workaround for that is add a column and call latitude and longitude to your database and then set up as part of your triggers and execute when a new record gets created to update the latitude to be equal to this little string right here, right? The shape.sty, you know, now, STY says that's the latitude. Shape is the geometry field in the database for D3 outfalls. That's pretty straightforward and simple. And that means, of course, that your attribute data always has the latitude and the longitude uh, for the feature encoded as an actual readable attribute that you can embed on reports or use to do other stuff. Um, another trigger trick. Let's say you'd uh, deployed your database, it's been in use, and then people decide 
oh, we want to set a default value for a field. Well, that becomes a problem because you can't really change it once you've populated with data and done a lot of other stuff, right? But what you can do is you can set the default value up as part of a trigger. So if a user leaves a field blank, you can say this trigger executes and sets the, the value for that thing to be whatever you want the default to be, to like this case, no, where the value is currently null. So that way, you know, you don't have any empty fields in the database. All right, this is a clever trick. Let's say you want to um, see some extra geometry out there. Um, see, I think I have that here, right? Oh, nope, let's see. Here we go. So let's say you wanted to see the bounding box that is around um, particular shapes in your data, and you want to see them on the map. You can create a view by using this select statement, right? This select statement will actually create in a ready to map. You can create a view, just call it, you know, you can give it a name, it's this query, and then you can add it and publish it, and the field would be bounding box, and it would draw a box around all the, in this case, the lines um, that have a bounding, you know, that, um, bounding box contains. So if you wanna see bounding boxes, you can use like that. Oh, this is something I should point out. If you wanna examine the coordinates, there's a lot of little calls that you can use to extract the coordinates from the shape field in your database. So this is the latitude and longitude, right? There they are, right, from, um, Let's, let's do this. Let's go. So, you know, the longitude, right? And then you can do the same thing. Hey, John, just wanted to give you a quick warning. We're almost at 10 minutes to the hour, um, and there oh. are quite a lot of questions. So, Start wrapping oh, no. up soon. That'd be okay, so I'm going to go into hyperdrive because <laughs> I could go for another hour just on these things in front of me. Um, so, anyways, yeah, don't, don't let me drag it all out. Here's another important little trick. Now, I'm going to stay in this window more than the PowerPoint right now. Here's an example. Sometimes, if you're using something like Collector or uh, Survey123, it is entirely possible to null out the shape field, but the record exists. Well, what happens is the shape field itself becomes an empty collection, which means, of course, you get errors um, and it can't draw, right? And those are issues, right? That's why having a backup of your data is always important. But if you have a database set up and it's got related records to you, you know, the first thing that crosses your mind is, oh, I'll just go grab that feature out of the, the backup and insert it in there, we're all good. No, you're not because you have related records those relationships are all built on global IDs and all that goes away when you insert the new record, right? So there's another way you can do it. You can actually update the, the, the nulled out shape field with a SQL query right here. That SQL query, can you hear, can you hear me? Yeah. Am I still alive? Yep, you're good. Okay, I got a pop up on my screen that said my my connection is unstable, so I didn't know what's going on. This this SQL statement will actually update the coordinates of an empty collection shape field with new valid coordinates. Now you can also extend this by ex writing a SQL statement to extract the coordinates from another feature class and then insert them in here. That way, you maintain all your relationships and your, your life will be a lot easier with that, right? Um, let's uh, use the slideshow now as a cheat sheet. Maybe you wanna do an experiment and update attributes in a feature class with attributes from other feature classes. You know, you have your geoprocessing tools that you can use to do that, but you can just as easily write a SQL query that does this 
This particular SQL query has show me the facility ID, the drainage basin, the county, and the county code for all the facilities in this feature class that fall within a polygon in this feature class, right? And the, of course, it's just the argument is where this ST within, that's a ST geometry argument, and it's a Boolean, so it'll evaluate as a zero or one, one meaning it falls within it. So you can use it to select out data. You can also use it to update data. Let's see, let's move to another one here quick. Uh, some people love having links to outside maps. So you can actually write a SQL query that would build links to there's three different ones, right? Google Maps, Bing Maps, and OpenStreetMaps. So these are all the exact same record. I could click the link, but I'm not gonna do it now because I'm running short on time. But you can store that data as an attribute in the field uh, of an attribute table, and people could click on it because it'll appear as a hyperlink, and then their application would shell out to whatever you've done. So here again, you can do that most easily for points though, not for large line collections. That's a picture of what it would look like. Hey. See. Yeah. Hey, John, hey, we're about four or five minutes left here. And I didn't know if uh, you wanted to get a couple questions in before oh, we, yes. well, we got yeah, off. Please. Okay. So, uh, and uh, Ali, you wanna, or I, I think this might be something good that we, Maybe we, we might have to do a part two here and uh, go through some of this stuff, Ollie, down the road with John. But sure, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll take any questions. I'll shut up now because I do have too many more slides. I wasn't really watching the time. I was just yakking. Oh no, no, this is fantastic. So, uh, um, but yeah, I definitely think uh, we'll. If you're open to a part two, I think we should probably sure. this one off. So. Yeah, and, but if anybody has a question that you want me to try to answer, I'd be happy to do so. Yeah, Ali, do we have a few questions we want to get in? Sure. Um, Tom asks, uh, what's the effective limit how long a field name should be, not could be? Uh, uh, 200, I think 256 characters is the SQL Server limit yes. but i guess i guess like they're like asking a, like what what's, what's the ideal um like oh there's no thing. ideal yeah so i mean it's what works for you but i think there are physical limitations and i think 256 characters is the actual limit of how long they will allow that and i could be wrong but i think it's 256 but if you come up with a field that's more than 256 characters long you need to rethink your naming plan Got love to get comments on uh, cases and care and mm -hmm. field lengths. <laughs> we have some uh, comments on X ray using X ray to reorder uh, some database fields. It's uh, uh, someone asked, uh, was a similar product ever made for Pro? But I think that's in relation to one of the previous comments. So I'm not sure, Heather, uh, what you're referring to. And we have one here that says, curious, I've run into some issues with null data not working with third-party applications, like Cartograph, for instance. Correct. Is there a process you've used to quickly eliminate these? So you, that's, that's where, you, that, like I said at the beginning, um, consider your database design. If you don't have, if you have fields that somehow are regularly getting null, right, then you want to rethink them and say, okay, do we want to either set up a default value or alternatively, do we want to address them with a trigger so that we can automate that, right? So the trigger would ensure that null values would not be in the database because it gets, you know, the trigger gets executed when you want it to execute, right? On a update, create event, right? And so you, your, your trigger um, would then go out there. Let's see if I can bring something up just to show you real fast here. Um, let's see. So triggers, so this is just a collection of triggers, right? Um, so the trigger here, this trigger is doing, this is where the trigger is, right? And this trigger says, all right, when, when a record gets created, 
do this, right? And so that means these fields are never null, right? Calculate this, that means it's never null. So the inspection got never null. These, these think kinds of things, right? Set. Set the value so that you don't have the null to deal with. Otherwise, you'll end up with a lot of nulls in your data. Okay. And nulls create problems all the way around. Well, everybody, we, we definitely have quite a few questions here. And I, I tell you what, uh, we'll get these questions uh, sent out to, to John and see if, if you'll be able to answer them and we can post those up on our website. Um, sure. I think Ollie and I will definitely uh, uh, catch up with John and maybe see about a part two or, or probably even could coordinate something in the evening time where we kind of have just an open forum Q&A to kind of just go through these things. So if you're open to that, John. Yeah, um, that'd be fun. Yeah, I think, I think uh, uh, that could be a lot of fun. But uh, hey, it's one o'clock here. Uh, this is the last speaker series of the year in 2021 uh, here in Texas. Uh, we really appreciate y'all attending. I think, Ollie, did I see uh, 101, 102 people today? Yeah, that's what I said. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, John, we, we really appreciate you uh, uh, presenting today. And uh, uh, John's been doing this a long time. I messed up earlier, but he's been doing this since 1989 and, and uh, uh, brings a, a wealth of experience and knowledge to the table. So um, everybody, uh, please look forward to this being up on our YouTube channel. Uh, we'll post this as soon as we can get it kind of cleaned up and, and post it up. And definitely, we, we uh, appreciate it. My name is Brian King, and uh, my co-host, uh, Ollie Powers, and I, we, we, uh, we've had a really good time. So, John, thanks a bunch. All right. Thank you. We'll see you all at the